Are you interested in investing in real estate but don't know where to start? Are you interested in leveling up your real estate investing game? Welcome to the Level Up REI podcast, the ultimate real estate investing podcast that is created by your host, Lisa Hilton, to take your real estate investing to the next level. Join Lisa Hilton on her amazing podcast episodes that will provide you with education, inspiration, and opportunities to enable you to level up your real estate investing game. Welcome everyone to the Level Up REI podcast. This is your host, Lisa Hilton, and today I have another amazing guest on the episode today. Um, His name is Dan Hansford. So Dan is one of the managing partners with PassiveInvesting.com, which is a national passive apartment investing firm based in the Carolinas. Um, And he has led his apartment syndication company to acquire over 2,200 units with a portfolio valued over $274 million. Um, He is also a passive apartment investor himself, and he has invested in over 4,800 units in 21 different syndication investments across the Southeast US and Texas. Um, So I'm super excited to have Dan on. Thank you, Dan, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Well, Lisa, I appreciate you inviting me on. It's an honor and uh, looking forward to providing some value to you and your audience. Awesome. So to get started, um, I know you have a rich background in business. Um, So to get started with my guest, can you talk about how you got started investing in real estate? Sure. Well, it it goes back to uh, paying money to the government in taxes, in the form of taxes. And you know, as you, as I started to build out my businesses, started to cash flow them very nicely. I actually have a group of non-surgical orthopedic medical clinics that's located here in the Carolinas. I have one in where I'm located, which is in Columbia, South Carolina. I have one in Greenville, South Carolina, Charleston, and North Augusta. And with those clinics, as I built them up, you know, I obviously cash flowing off of them very nicely. Each time we would open up another clinic, we'd have to pay more and more money in taxes. And, Mm -hmm. you know, my wife at the time was the one that basically said, you know, why are we having to pay more and more money? And I just would tell her like, I, I was, cause I was so busy in the growth aspect of the clinics right. that I would say, well, it's a good thing. It means we're making more money. So the more money you make, the more money you got to pay. <laughs> and, uh, and then of course you start to hear about other people that, you know, make even more money than you, but they're paying zero in taxes. And it's because they actually are investing the funds that they're making back into real estate, not back into, but into real estate type of investments Mm -hmm. and allows you to be able to have the depreciation, to be able to offset your taxes and or offset your other income and things like that. And and so that's uh, the main reason why I got into where we are today and starting the group. So it's, uh, it's, been, it's, been, it's been fun and uh, it's been great to kind of see how we've grown from, you know, our first acquisition of an $8.9 million property upwards to the last two deals that are close to about $50 million on the last one and just over $50 million on the, on the one prior to that. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and before we sort of come off of the business aspect, were you like practicing essentially in that space, um, like say as a doctor and then sort of then moved into then real estate. So my, my background is actually in chiropractic to be, um, when I first got started and when I, right when I got out of chiropractic college, I started my very first chiropractic clinic Mm -hmm. and then about two to three years into it, I realized that I was basically I went to school for a job basically because mm-hmm. I had, I'm, I was still trading time for dollars and I still, if I wanted to go on vacation for a week, I basically wasn't going to make any money because there was nobody in the office to see the mm-hmm. patients. And so I, I quickly learned that early on and decided to first hire on some associate chiropractors to work for me to be able to do some of the day to day. And then I started integrating with the medical field. So I had some MDs that I hired, nurse practitioners. And then about probably four to five years ago, I actually made the decision to completely cut out the chiropractic and the rehab services that we were doing to solely focus on all of the medical stuff. So now it's full on medical clinics. We've got about 50 employees that work with us and, uh, and it's, it's, it's been, it's been great. So it's been one of those things where we do non-surgical orthopedics and sports medicine. We also focus on a lot of regenerative medicine, like Mm -hmm. prolotherapy, PRP and stem cell treatments for orthopedic conditions and seeing the results from patients is really kind of why we decided to kind of, you know, take away or take out the chiropractic services 
so that for one, I didn't have to see the patients, right? right. But also for the fact that we were able to uh, leverage our relationships with outside chiropractors now and physical therapists to start to refer to us to allow us to continue to grow that type of those types of treatments in the community. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and then I guess through that experience, it, I, it sounds like to me, you've also sort of saw a niche that you liked maybe the operations of like the business aspect of business um, mm -hmm. of, yeah, of having a business and like running a business and hiring people. Yeah, no, I think I, I definitely don't like the hiring aspect. Um, I know it's a necessary evil. Like we need to have to, you know, hire right. people to in order to expand and grow. Um, but I don't like to be the person to find those people, find the next person. You know? <laughs> um, and of course, but in the beginning I had to do it all myself. And I'll, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned very on in order for me to be able to kind of have the, the, the hockey, tick, hockey stick growth that I was looking for in the clinics, I had to learn early on that I needed to surround myself with solid people and, and I have a solid team that supported me because I, I'm, I'm the typical entrepreneur. And, and for those of you who are listening who are entrepreneurs or business owners, I, you might relate to this, but I am the type of person where I feel like I can do everything better than everybody else, right? And even to this day, I still feel that way, but and I know it's not true, but I still have that kind of mental block. Right. And I realize that, and I still realize that every day it's a struggle. Like every day I get up and I'm like, what am I doing right now that I should be hiring a good solid person to do so that I don't have to do it and I can focus right. on the growth and what's next for the, for, the, for the businesses. And that to me, learning that ability to delegate tasks to somebody else and the mental kind of game that I play with myself with that is if I can take, if I can get at least 80 to 85%, if I can find somebody that can do at least 80 to 85% as good as I think I can do it, then I can go ahead and hire them and let them do it. And I'll tell you this, Lisa, that those people surprise me sometimes just mm. because they'll do it even better than what I thought I could do it for, you know? <laughs> Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so then moving on to, you know, given your platform, like, you know, for me, I have sort of followed you, like I've sort of seen you out there, um, you know, in the multifamily space and, you know, providing value and sort of helping investors. Um, and given the current environment that we are in, um, you know, COVID and et cetera, um, what are, I'd like to take some time to explore some of the key things that passive investors need to sort of think about as they navigate investing over the next couple of months and perhaps even in the next couple of years as the market starts to change. Sure, um, sure. Well, I, I think one of the, there's a, there's a couple of different, you know, things yeah. that we should be looking out for. I think right now is the time that, uh, you know, we should be looking at the underwriting of these projects a little bit closer than what maybe we would have, would have looked at before, because I've seen some projects that have been released even in the middle of COVID-19 that, you know, this, I don't feel like are going to work because there's a lot of assumptions that you have to make in underwriting. And right now, those assumptions are very hard to make. And it's going to be very challenging over the next, I think probably the next probably, you know, three to six to possibly up to 12 months to really have hone in and have an understanding of the full impact that COVID-19 has had, um, not just on COVID-19, not just on multifamily, but on, on, you know, real estate in general. I think there are definitely asset classes that are going to get hit, hit a lot worse than what we're seeing in multifamily. Multifamily, I think, has been spared very, very, very well during the whole COVID-19. If you look at the asset classes, to me, I think as a passive investor, because like you mentioned in my intro, I do passively invest as well. And I know you mentioned 21 investments. I'm now actually in 23. And I know I sent you that bio just, just recently, but <laughs> I forgot to update it because I'd already started to invest in two other ones since then. But right. um, when I look at various operators, I want to make sure that I'm investing in markets that I think are going to be solid, stable markets that I, I would say are blue chip stabilized markets, I have blue chip corporations in that market. And then I also want to make sure that the asset class that I'm investing in is going to be a solid one as well. And the asset class is that the asset class within multifamily that has been hit the worst is the lower end assets, those C class and lower end B products that are, are having a hard time meeting some of their, their underwriting guidelines that they had, had set before because of rent growth assumptions and renovation timelines and all of those are out the window. 
And so those are going to be the ones that are going to be having a hard, a more challenging time. And I'm in a few of those projects myself mm -hmm. um, as a passive investor. And there have been deals where I'm not getting distributions now because of it. Um, thankfully, with all of our projects, the, ca the cash flows have been coming in great. We haven't had to withhold distributions from any of our investments so far from our projects. Not to say that we might not have to do it in the future, but so far up to this point, we haven't. Um, but I think one of the things that you have to, to look at is, is, you know, when you're looking at asset classes right now as a passive investor, when you look at any investment, the lower the return, the lower the risk, the higher the return, the higher the risk. And so same thing within multifamily, you have these really nice assets that are these class A assets, usually safer, secure investments, they're, they're lower return, right? And then you have these middle of the road ones, which are your B class assets, which have moderate returns and they're, they have moderate risk. And then you have the C class assets, which actually have the highest risk, but they also have the highest reward, right? But you're balancing that high reward with that high risk. And so as a passive investor, first thing I would say is, is making sure that you're, you're, you're diversified, right? Right now, I'm personally only investing in B plus assets and A class assets. I'm staying away from any of the low, lower end Bs or the C class assets right now. And it's because of the way the market is right now and how um, the lower end assets are also the assets that those are usually the, the residents that are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. And when you have some sort of disruption like this, it's going to cause them to have a harder time being able to, to make those obligations that they set out in the lease agreements. But when you're buying assets that have people who are renting by choice, not by necessity, then they usually have some excess funds to be able to put up if they need to, but they're also usually in a, a better paying position where they're not necessarily being threatened by COVID-19. Right. And the people that are getting, that are losing their jobs the most right now are the, 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 the lower paying jobs, which are in those lower end assets. And so for me, those are kind of a couple of you know, kind of uh, talking points that I always try to bring up with investors to, to look at when they're looking at investing in, in other projects and even our own projects. I mean, obviously when we find projects, they always, you know, kind of, we're going to, we're going to fit the criteria that I want to have in the projects and our other two partners, but we want to make sure that when, because we know we're not the only group that people right. are investing in and are, are vetting. And so our, I even have, I even wrote a, uh, uh, an article, which is the five red flags for passive investors. And you guys, if you, if one of you, if any of you are listeners who are on here want that, they can certainly go to our website, passiveinvesting.com and sign up for our investor club. And we'll definitely send that over to you. But um, th those are the, those are the really kind of the high level things that I would say, Lisa, are the big yeah. things that I would watch out for. Um, and then, you know, sort of bridging off of that, when it comes to like vetting operators, you even mentioned like, you know, People do have a choice in who they choose to invest with. Um, you know, outside of like, I guess the different asset classes, are there certain things that you would advise or recommend for passive investors as they're thinking about vetting operators at this time? Oh, there's a couple of things here. I'm, I'm a big, and I'm a big believer in investing with somebody who is full-time in the business. So this, they need to be treating this syndication business um, and taking investor funds as a true business. And I, I won't personally invest with somebody, especially right now. Um, but even before COVID-19, I won't personally invest with somebody unless they are full-time because now, now if they're working a corporate job or something like that and they're, they've partnered with somebody else, that's totally mm -hmm. different. But the main operator, I feel it needs to be full-time because number one, we're in it ourselves as a full-time operators and we know it's a full-time gig and it's not one of those things that I'm willing to put my own hard-earned money into somebody else's properties that they're basically just running those properties as like a nights and weekends kind of job. Mm -hmm. And I want them to make sure that they're taking it seriously. And, and, and right now you're seeing that and then one of the other key things when you're vetting an operator is making sure that that operator has some form of background in business and being able to manage people, manage systems, processes, put in certain key performance indicators to make sure that they can pivot when they need to pivot and make changes, especially right now. You know, you, you, this is the type of, of, of an event, this kind of black swan event that you need to have somebody at the helm that can make some of those hard decisions. Got it. Yeah. Um, definitely. Um, and then sort of moving on from that, I guess one of the areas that, 
you know, comes up for a lot of people at this time is returns. You know, obviously, as the market changes, um, people get concerned about what the returns are going to look like and how that's going to impact things. Um, I think where I'd like to start, um, and then you can sort of pivot accordingly, is like the preferred return versus no preferred return structure and your thoughts on that and what investors need to look out for when they're looking at deals with those kinds of structures. Sure. So as far as the preferred returns, I, I will not invest with a deal as a passive investor unless it has preferred returns because that, those preferred returns are what align the interest very closely with the operator or the sponsor and you as the investor. And so to actually um, find a deal that has no preferred returns, I mean, I, to me, it's not even something I'll even consider and look at. And that's something I, I, I recommend to our investors to make sure that there's always a preferred return there because it, there's a couple of reasons for that. So you know, an operator that needs to have the share of the cash flows on, the, on that first fruits, if you will, those first, mm -hmm. let's just say it's a 7% preferred return. If they need to share in that instead of giving the preferred return, they're probably not a group that's well capitalized enough for me to want to invest with them. But they have to have that to be able to survive, right? And for me, I want to make sure I'm investing with people who are well capitalized and they have the ability to jump in if they need to. And I also want to make sure that my investors and our projects are getting those first fruits because as a, from the standpoint of the syndicator, we couldn't put together these projects and do them without our investors. Right. And so I'm not, the, our, our group is not the type of group that's just wanted to put one project together or one deal. We want to be able to put on these projects for decades and decades, grow our wealth as well as our investors' wealth together. And the only way we're going to do that is aligning our interests with the investors and making sure we take care of their, their interests more than ours. Yeah. Um, and then sort of building on that, I know that recently there's a lot of dual class structures um, these days where you'll have a preferred equity and then you have the preferred return. Can you sort of dive into like the pros and cons for um, that kind of structure? Sure, sure. So, um, and what you're, what, what Lisa is referring to is, is, you know, uh, there's usually like a class A or a class B and not asset. We're talking about within the deal itself, there's a class A investor and then there's a, a class B investor. And of course there's class C, which would be the operator, but the class A investor would be in a preferred equity position. And for those of you to kind of, that are listening to kind of fully understand this, you have to understand what a capital stack is and the way briefly what a capital stack the way it actually works is it's built from the bottom up. And so the priority level of the investor starts from the bottom and then goes up, meaning that the bottom of the capital stack is usually the debt. So the senior note, or the senior lender. And then right after that is usually going to be this kind of class A investor, which is that preferred equity piece that you mentioned, Lisa. And in that particular capital stack, I believe you have to be careful too, because it can be enticing to want to invest in a class A because of the types of returns that can be inside of that class A. But if it gets to be too much of the capital stack, then it actually is the risks don't outweigh the benefits, if you will, because the lower, the lower um, amount in the capital stack that you have. So for example, if the common equities need is, is, is $10 million, right. Mm -hmm. And you're raising $10 million for the property. It's better to, it's best to have a, anywhere between about a 20 to about a 40% uh, capital stack reserved for that preferred equity piece. The lower that capital, that, that, that percentage of that capital stack, the better it is and the lower the risk it is for that class A investor. Because it, the class A investor is gonna be the one that gets paid first mm -hmm. before anybody else gets paid. So once the lender's paid, the class A investor gets paid, then the class B investor gets paid. So it's as close to a guarantee as you can get being in that class A position. But you can see that if I have to pay out more in class A, it's going to take more monies to be able to fill that bucket up versus if it's going to be a lower, the lower amount of the, that equity, equity stack. And so then that preferred equity position is usually going to have no participation in the upside or like when we have a capital event or when we sell, they're going to be maxed at a percentage of return. And usually I'm seeing those between about nine to 10% um, returns. So you'll usually see those class A's. And uh, so you'll, but you'll get that usually paid out on monthly or quarterly basis. I prefer monthly. That's what our group does is monthly right. um, returns. But the, the class B investor, 
they're going to still have a preferred return. It's just going to be lower. So it'll be a 7% preferred return and not 9 or 10%. But then they'll also have that opportunity to participate in the upside when you sell the asset or some form of a capital event. And so whenever the, 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 the person who's as an investor, as a passive investor, you have to ask yourself, which one do you want to be in? Mm -hmm. Do you want to have more of that preferred equity position, position where you're going to have a lot lower risk, uh, a lot more surety of getting your preferred return of that nine or 10% and being able to uh, make the decision. Do you want, do you want more cash flows and you want those now, but no participation in the upside or are you the type of person that doesn't really need to need a lot of cash flows right now, even though there's still some really nice, you know, seven or 8% you know, cash flows on there or, and, but you still have that participation on the upside. So those are the kind of questions that you have to ask. And then, you know, you can also look at doing a blended option where instead of just doing A or B, you can say, do, let me, let me take a hundred thousand, put 50,000 50, in A, 50,000 in B, right. and kind of diversify those risks within the same investment vehicle. And so there's a lot of different considerations to take into account when it comes to which one of those class A or class B you want to be into. But I will tell you that the more sophisticated investor that you have, um, and, this, and they will actually probably prefer to be in that preferred equity piece because you pretty much are eliminating the majority of any of the risk of that investment at all by getting that surety of that 9%. But when it's being paid out monthly, they'll take that monthly payout and reinvest it in a different vehicle. And right. so they're compounding that, per, that return by reinvesting those higher cash flows. Yeah, got it, got it, got it. Um, and then from a syndicator's point of view, when you guys choose to do, like make this offering, is it to attract um, different types of investors with different needs, essentially? Well, or different you, wants? It's, it's for a couple of reasons. It actually, it doesn't make it any better for the syndicator. It actually uh, lowers the return for the syndicator themselves because when you're giving up more of the cash flows for the class A, then you're having a 9% pref and now you have a 7% pref. So you're actually getting less. So it doesn't help you from a, you get to make more money doing it that way from a syndicator's perspective. But when you first underwrite a deal, if a deal has really high cash flows, but the overall return on that investment is lower, say like on, on, on a deal we did recently, we had, we underwrote a deal and it was around a, like a, like a nine and a half, 10% um, IRR internal rate of return mm -hmm. on a seven year hold. When we first underwrote it with no dual class, it was a single class structure. Well, trying to present that to an investor, it's not as palatable, right? They want to see a little bit higher on that internal rate of return in order to come off their wallet and actually invest with you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for us, being able to have those higher cash flows allow us to be able to give up some of those cash flows to that class A investor. And because they're not sharing in the upside, that all the upside gets shifted over to class B and it makes for a higher return for those class B investors. So it also helps us to attract investors that want to have that. But then, like you said earlier, it does also give options for investors. So right. they can either choose the cash flow route or more of the growth model route and, and or, or diversify. Got it. Awesome. Um, and then at this point, uh, one other thing that is really key for me is um, reserves. Um, so still talking on the topic of like passive investors looking to invest in real estate deals in this current marketplace. Um, you know, having sufficient reserves and what does sufficient reserves really mean? <laughs> like in a market condition such as this one. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, I'm a big believer in making sure you have more than, than, and not having enough, right? So more is actually better. Mm -hmm. so, some, some syndicators would say that they would prefer not to have as much because it actually lowers returns for the investors when you have um, a high amount of operating reserves, because that money you have to usually raise up front when you first acquire the deal and it just sits in a bank account, right? And obviously you might put it in, a, in like a small, you know, money market account where you're earning 1% or something like that, but it's still, it's costing you money to sit right. there. But when you actually look at the risks versus the benefits, you actually are lowering the risk for the investment because investors are always fearful of a capital call, right? right. The deal starting to go south and then they read the operator reaching out to you saying, Hey, we need everybody to infuse another $5,000 a piece to be able to allow the property to, you know, uh, float or whatever the, whatever the capital right. call structure would be like. It's always dependent upon the equity amount that you own and, and stuff like, excuse me, and stuff like that. But uh, I would rather have 
over 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 other over raise and have a high capital reserve account and not having to uh, go do those capital calls. So it makes it less riskier for those investors and they don't have to worry about in a few any future capital calls um, because you have those operating reserves. And so we like to see in our deals, we like to see at least four to six months of operating reserves, meaning if the property goes all the way down to 0% occupancy, then we can continue to float that property for four to six months. And we try never to dip into it, right? We never really wanna dip into that operating reserve, but it's there as a just in case. And we've run the scenarios of doing it versus not doing it. And it only changes the returns by about one percentage point or a hundred basis points. So to us, it's worth that extra level of kind of comfort and security to have that there in case we need it versus giving up that, having all the investors get an extra 1%. Mm -hmm. And all the investors we've talked to are like, oh yeah, absolutely. I'd rather have that extra fund reserve there as a just in case emergency fund if we need it versus having to have the worry of losing the property because we didn't have enough in operating reserves and we couldn't raise money from the capital call or bringing on other investors. And it just makes things a lot more complicated when you try to do that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, and then going from there, you know, multifamily being, and you sort of mentioned this earlier about, you know, it being an asset that is performing, has performed fairly well, despite the current um, conditions. Um, do you, what are your thoughts long-term on multifamily being a resilient asset and perhaps why you would think, if you do think it is a re resilient asset, what are some of the reasons why you think so? Sure. Well, I think multifamily um, historically has done really well, even in, even in downturns and recessions and corrections and, you know, pandemics and things like that. And, you know, one of the things that we're seeing right now is the demand for multifamily is, is, is just going up. And there's just, there's, 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 there's two reasons for that. You know, one of the major reasons right now in the middle of COVID-19 is that people are being forced to stay where they're at, right? So they can't go find a house. They can't leave and go buy a house. And they're also, the lenders are have tightened up their restrictions for their lending. And so people who might've qualified before aren't going to qualify now. And those people also are having to dip into some of their, their, their savings. And so they might not have a high enough of a down payment. So all of that, you know, what all that, all of that does, what, what that all does is that actually forces people to stay in the rental market longer, or if they were planning to actually go buy a house or, or whenever they you know, left for college or whatever, it forces them to, to actually enter the multifamily market. And then on the other side of it, if you look at pandemics over the last hundred years, it's really done three things um, from the, from multifamily. It's created, uh, uh, it's created marriages, it's created divorces, and it's also created babies because we're staying at home, right? So, you know, come, come January and February, 2021, there's gonna be a lot of Corona babies out there. And all that does is increase, increase the demand for multifamily. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, and then I think one of the last questions I have um, before I get into my level up, um, my last three level up questions is something you mentioned earlier that I wanted to circle back on, which is the key performance indicators. Um, I feel that in the current environment, asset management is like super, becomes like the primary focus you know, to sort of move through the storm. Um, and I'm curious about the key performance indicators that um, are imperative that, you know, good asset managers are putting in place to ensure that the properties do survive the storm. Sure. Well, I mean, I would say that there's, there's not just a few of them. We have probably close to about 60 to 70 KPIs that we keep track of on a weekly basis. And we have our property management companies submit those to us that so we're keeping track of those on a very uh, close basis. But obviously right now, one of the biggest KPIs we've got to watch is collections, right? We've got to make sure that the collections are staying high and staying stable. And so we get a daily report from our property management companies to, to let us know what is the status of the overall collections for that property for that month. And we're comparing that to the prior months so we can see what was it like before COVID-19 and what is it right now and how does it act, how is it actually faring? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are we staying stable? And when we see that kind of data and those trends, it allows us to be able to make decisions and change and, and, and pivot whenever we need to pivot. If for some reason we see one property lagging or, the, or, or, or things like that, we can jump in and see why is it lagging? What are some of the issues? What are the problems? And then jump in and try to create some solutions to those problems to be able to make sure we can maintain 
getting those high level of collections on the property. So the collections and the collection percentages are really, really crucial right now. And of course, just like any multifamily asset, COVID-19 or not, you got to be monitoring the traffic on the property and the monitoring the property manager to see if they're getting traffic to the property, are they signing leases? And if they are, you know, or if they're, and if they're not, why are they not signing leases? Is there a problem with the property? Is there a problem with the property manager? You know, and we have to keep track of those on a weekly basis. And I know some people that look at them on a quarterly basis, mm -hmm. but you can't, you got to look at those things on a very close basis like that. And we have a full-time director of asset management who, who manages that for us and is watching those things on a, on a weekly basis to make sure that if we need to pivot, we can pivot. Awesome. Um, and then last, any recommendations, any further recommendations or things that I didn't touch on that you think would be beneficial for passive investors um, listening today to think about or know? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things we kind of touched on it earlier mm -hmm. is a lot of times when we're thinking about passive, in, I mean, passive investing in multifamily, there's the whole philosophy of, you know, in a downturn or recession that, you know, A's go to B's and, you know, B's don't want to go down to C's, like B's mm -hmm. is the best place to be in. And I think we've all kind of heard that in this space, but uh, we've actually done some, some research ourselves inside of the software called CoStar, uh, which is a, a data analytics software that dates uh, uh, properties all the way back to 2000 and has occupancy levels and things like that. And we've done some analysis to determine that, is that actually true? Mm -hmm. And it is true that it happens on a, on a small level that there are people that do shift from A's to B's and you even see B's going on to C's. So even people who say, Oh, no, no B's go to C's. It does happen. It's just part of the process, but right. it's only, it only takes a, a drop in all the asset classes of about 30 to 50 basis points across each asset class. So it's not like it's a major run. Now, what I think you're going to see right now, which we really haven't talked about at all with COVID mm -hmm. is that there's going to be a big push from urban living to suburban living. So you're going to see a lot of people migrating from some of these tight, close um, 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 cities and you're going to start seeing people migrating out of those cities but you're also going to see like msas like let's just say say charlotte for example you're going to see a lot of those charlotte um uh, uh, urban lifestyles starting to migrate out and be filling up some of so the, the class days that i think are going to get hit the worst are those mm -hmm. urban class days that are number one higher rent so usually you know three four five six thousand dollars a month in rent but they're also in a downtown urban living and they're going to start seeing people starting to push out and it's going to be called the great migration if you will i think <laughs> uh, over over the next probably you know one to, to two possibly three years you're going to start to see that wow Wow. Um, and then I guess uh, investors will have to get creative about how they then pivot the use of those, those uh, multifamilies or, you know, maybe the way in which they're built or what they're used for going forward as well, I'm guessing. Yeah, they'll definitely have to be making some pivots and some changes with that. And, you know, obviously when people start to migrate away, they will try to attract people back in. So mm -hmm. will, I think they will still eventually see them come back in because right. probably in the next one to two years, you're going to see that migration out. And then of course, those class A's, when they lose, they'll start to lower their prices to a point where it attracts people to come back in. Sure. So you're going to see this migration out. I don't think you're going to see as many migrating back in, but you're going to definitely see people migrating back in as it makes it more appealing for those people to come in. And like you said, they're going to have to make some pivots and changes to maybe some of the structures of how they're set up and stuff. Awesome. All right. Um, and then my last um, questions, which is my level up questions. Um, the first one is what are you grateful for in your life right now? I'm very grateful for my beautiful family. We got, I'm, I'm married and have four children, beautiful children right now. They're all under 10. So there's definitely a busy household. <laughs> um, so, but I have a, a nine-year-old girl, three, uh, a nine-year-old girl, a three-year-old girl and a two-year-old girl. And I also have an eight-year-old boy. So um, it's been, it's been a pleasure watching them kind of grow up and, you know, looking forward to kind of seeing them grow as well. And it's nice to be in a position where, you know, I have that ability to have the freedom to be able to spend more time with them, especially sure. during these formative years. Awesome. Um, and then what has attributed to your continuous growth and success? I would say the delegation is one of the, one of the biggest keys that I've, ha I've had for my success. And then going all along the sides, the same lines of, the, of watching the KPIs. I'm a big believer in that if you can't measure it, then you can't manage it. And so that is one of the biggest things that uh, 
I would say has been a big contributor of my success is making sure that I measured everything that I can measure, even to the point of being like nauseous, looking at all these different numbers, because you never know when there's going to be a certain number that really is a, as a crucial stat or statistic that you have that will allow you to make some changes that will, 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 will save something, will save an investment, save a business, save a division, whatever it might be. Awesome. Um, and then what do you know now that you wish you knew in the beginning of your journey? <laughs> well, I, I wish I would have started investing in multifamily sooner rather than later. I mean, I, uh, I started late when it, with my business career investing in it because, you know, I, I, had, I was so focused on growing the business and I would pour, we would only take out of the business what we felt like we needed. And then we would pour all the money back into the business and it's, it's, it's served us well, but I also wish I would have known about this earlier on. So I could have started the investing side of things uh, uh, probably about at least probably five to seven years ago. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So that's it. Um, you know, if my listeners would love to, you know, learn more about you and your offerings, like what's some of the best places that they can go to find out more information? Sure. It's, it's very simple, very straightforward. You can simply go to passiveinvesting.com and on that website, on the top right hand corner, you will see a little blue button that says join the passive investor club. And then I will, uh, my, my assistant will actually reach out to you and schedule a one-on-one -on -one phone call and we'll discuss your investment goals and see if you're the right fit for us. And uh, when we have our next offer, we look forward to having some people partner with us. And uh, thank you so much for having me on, Lisa. I really appreciate yes. it. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. That has been another episode of the Level Up REI podcast. I hope this episode has provided you with knowledge, insights, inspiration, and opportunities to level up your real estate investing and other areas of your life. We'd love to hear from you. So if you have any thoughts, comments, or suggestions for topics to cover, feel free to visit our website, www.lisahilton.com. And while you are there, check out our blogs and newsletters. Remember, your level of success will rarely exceed your level of personal development because success is something you attract by the person you become.